and we're gonna kind of go from the beginning here. Are we up there. So Dr. Morrison's a much more efficient surgeon, so he's actually gonna do the whole case on on film compared to that the other guy yesterday. Who was that guy? That guy. So I think um, as we talked about, we got a varus knee, and you know when I give her a varus stress, she she goes into you know I'd say. 10 to 12 degrees and I said she was correctable so with a little flexion we can we can almost get her back to neutral and as I mentioned yesterday that's what I'm going to be shooting for is roughly uh, zero degrees mechanical axis so our incision is just a midline incision Anybody has questions here in the room, please just go up to the microphone and want this to be as interactive as possible. So, the curve may use. Uh, tourniquet every case, Dr. Morrison? Uh, tourniquet, pretty much every case, unless they have um, vascular disease, like one of the cases that uh, Dr. Barnes showed yesterday, or if yeah. they have a history of. Uh, any venous, you know, VTE stuff, DVT or PE, then I will avoid the tourniquet on those patients as well. Mark right there. We just, uh, with a clean marker, we mark our yeah. arthrotomy before we make it. And then I don't do any uh, sub vastus or mid vastus stuff. Have some some interest, but pretty much have just always been a medial peripatellar approach yeah the, the image is great good and you know this is a varus knee so obviously going around the medial side is going to help from a soft tissue standpoint uh, but this will this is pretty yeah. much my this will be my my opening approach for every knee um, even a valgus knee because I want to expose the medial side enough that I know I'm protecting the, the MCL. So we'll just take a cob around the inside. And so I think we can kind of see there, yeah, we got a view of the deep MCL as it's uh, inserting just below that osteophyte. So as far around as I can see, kind of mid-coronal, I'm going to peel it off the tibia so that it's in continuity with the superficial MCL going around. And I want to get about halfway around. All right, and then hopefully Dr. Christie's not in the room, but I do take some of the fat pad. I might have a heart attack. Ooh, I, I know. Sorry about that. So you're, that. A, you're a fat pad hater? Well. I'm conflicted, as you see, because I take out some of it and I leave some of it. So I'm kind of, I'm in between. I hedge my bets there. Make a little pocket for one of the retractors. And then um, I do cut the patella first to help get it out of the way. So if we can raise the bed, Amber. Do you always um, always take the patella or resurface the patella? I do always resurface the patella. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't take it out. I didn't mean that. I never resect it. I only resurface it. And uh, nice. I, I, I go around here. Um, part of this is more for exposure, uh, but you know it, it's not lost. It maybe maybe we're getting some of that denervation. I know the people that do not resurface uh, claim that, that that makes it where they're going to have less knee pain. So again, I'm kind of doing both. Yeah, so, the European way, right? Maybe right. a little denervation. That's 24. Amber, can you come up? We're going to go ludicrous height here. Um, I cut freehand. I like to get basically on eye level. It measured 24 before and she's probably going to be a 32 which is about nine millimeters so that's kind of what i'm shooting for my resection that's good and we're just going to eyeball this
So Jeff, I know you uh, have dabbled with not resurfacing the patella. What are your indications for not resurfacing it? Yeah. Um, well, it's a low number now. It's probably like five uh, percent. It's usually in a young patient, really no arthritis, and also a patella that mates well. And most most implant designs now are extremely patella friendly. Um, so I don't, I don't think that's been an issue. I, I mean, I haven't left a bunch, but luckily I haven't had to resurface any of those either. It's a little bit of the, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if you do it and they have anterior knee pain, it's not because of that. But if they went into somebody else's clinic or you're seeing somebody else's patient, then absolutely that's where it's coming from, right? So you need to resurface that patella. Yeah, and, you know, I do uh, pretty much 100% PS. So that's, now we're down to 15, so that's about 9 off, which I like. And we'll go ahead and drill for it. But uh, I think, you know, you're doing more CR knees, and that probably is a little bit friendlier for a non-resurfaced patella. I like that. So that's one clamp there and you have those, uh, looks like you can size it through that little transparent Correct. plastic. Yeah, so all the sizes yeah, cool. are kind of in one. Same drill um, hole. Same drill hole for all. Let's see the 32. And that's an asymmetric button and you're, are you trying to do a little medialization there? You just try to put it right along the sagittal ridge? Yeah, I try to get it as far uh, medial and pr uh, proximal as I can. And then this kind of avocado design gives good coverage, Ranger. You know, we talked yesterday about, you know, whether you uh, do a facetectomy or not. If I have much uncovered bone right here on this side, I will remove it. Uh, with a round patella, I find myself doing that a little bit more often, and with this design, uh, less often. I right, can come off of that, Carlos. Table down, please. Yeah. Right. So now we'll get on to the the meat of it. Get in that lateral retractor. That's good. Thank you. So you sound a little bit winded. Are you okay? Oh yeah. Usually Carlos does this for me, but you wore him out yesterday. So you see, uh, mostly medial disease, um, lateral compartment looks good. Don't have the blister on the lateral side. A little bit of patellofemoral disease. So I think uh, some surgeons that are really enthused about unis would have said this would be a good uni. So we'll. It's not uh, too late. Uh, it is for me. So we cut the ACL, and then if we've done our, a decent exposure on that medial side, we should be able to kind of dislocate the tibia out, which I like to do right here. And then this allows us to get the lateral meniscus. So this is one of the few times I let Matt um, grab any instrumentation. And he can pull for me. And then we'd get that lateral meniscus out. I saved the medial meniscus for the end because uh, I stress a lot about the medial collateral ligament. All yeah. right. That's so, a beautiful picture of anterior medial arthritis right there. That wear pattern on the tibia. So we're going, Matt just reminded me, thankfully, that we're going to get that lateral geniculate. Okay, let's put the Z in, Matt. That way we can see a little bit better. So I'm going to cut the distal femur first. I do like a little blowhole here because it, mm -hmm. it decompresses when we're going to put the bigger reamer up the intermedullary canal. And again, we're using navigation, so, but it's with the, with the GPS, this plus application we talked a little bit about last night, we're combining it with traditional instrumentation. So, you know, this IM setup is exactly what I would use with a non-navigated GPS case, except the block is a little bit different and it's got three adjustment knobs. So flexion extension, varus valgus, and depth. So we start off just setting it in a neutral position, but if you see, my default is still what I would normally do. So we're doing five degrees of uh, anatomic valgus on the left side and we're going to do a 10 millimeter resection since i'm ps i'm cutting the pcl i'm going to open the flexion gap a little bit so i take just a little bit more off the distal femur to compensate for that your implants nine distal craig uh it's eight actually so on eight. average you know we talk about opening the flexion gap about two millimeters when we cut the pcl 
I know that it, varies. Everybody gets five degrees of valgus, all comers, varus, valgus, knees. Everybody gets five degrees, that's right. So this is gonna be the tracker. So first we're gonna drill some smooth pins in, but this has to be extremely stable to the bone. So we're gonna put some threaded headed pins in as well, and that fixes a little bit more solid. Perfect. All right, now we can pull the so eye obviously, in um, you're. Yeah, you're referencing off your medial condyle, which is bald there, but in a valgus knee, if you had some cartilage, you go ahead and uh, scrape that off or cut a little bit off, or how do you, how do you deal with a, a valgus knee? Uh, you know, with the valgus knee, I still will reference off that medial side, and I don't take any yeah. cartilage off. Um, we'll see later as a gap balancer, I'm usually erring on the side of a little less bone, and then I'll check the spacer block and flexion extension. If I need to come back and take more bone, I will. So at this point, I've got the, um, the tracker on uh, the cutting block, so it's become the tracker. And now we're gonna register the femur. So we bring in the GPS into the wound. And so I don't have to tell it, I'm just gonna start circumducting the hip like you did yesterday. Let's see. show us where the hip center is. And then the points of registration are going to be where we made the IM canal here. Yeah, we, can we get a shot of the navigation screen? Can we, can we split screen that? or Perfect. There you go, thank you. So with this application, it's one point posterior medial. It's one point posterior lateral. And that's your most posterior point? Yes, because it, we're only cutting the distal femur, but it needs a little reference on rotation. If we were doing right. sizing and rotation, you'd want more points back there. We do need to paint here because we want to make sure we get the most distal point for our resection depth. Do that medial and laterally. Probably worthy of note too. Can we get a shot of the actual screen? So this is an in in the uh, what would you call it in the arena? So you know you have your your GPS screen that you can touch and interact with, correct? That's correct. It has, it has, right now it has displaced Matt as the assistant. So you can see on the screen, I'm, I'm the probe, I'm going over the bone. I just am making sure that what I see on the screen and what I see on the patient is actually the morph that happens so I can go to the next screen now. And so now- That's your we, validation. Now we see essentially what we're planning on cutting. So we put a, you know, a cut checker into the slot here. And so what we see, and this is not too uncommon with IM, is that we're pretty close to what we want. So we're in one degree of mechanical varus. We're in three degrees of flexion. I usually aim for four. So I'll adjust the flexion to four. And as I said, we're going for zero on the varus valgus. And so that gives me uh, really what I want there. And then my cut height, I'm getting 10 off the medial and lateral side in this patient to get zero degrees. So now I'm at least one degree better than I would have been if I'd just gone ahead and cut it. So now we'll make our cut. This is, this is where uh, I'm really nervous because yesterday you did the robot cut. Yeah. And of course you knew it was going to be accurate. Where do you get a saw like that that you have to hold? Yeah. That's cool. Now we'll see how uh, good the human robot is. So is that a slotted cut? Yeah, you're the slot. Yeah, I'm cutting through the slot. Yep. It's uh, four millimeters difference between the slot and the top, so if you wanted to cut on the top, you just would adjust it that way. All right, so now we're putting our tracker back on the femoral guide, and then we can check our cut and see what's happened. So we're good on the mechanical, and the saw not surprisingly skived just a little bit, so we went back to three on our flexion. 
But again, I'm not going to go for the uh, zero-itis. I'm going to take that and uh, say I'm already better than I would have been. So now we can take uh, the tracker off, take the block off, and move on to the tibia. That looks really good. So in this case, I'm taking out the threaded headed pins, but I'm going to leave the smooth pins in because I still don't know about the gap. So if I have to come back and cut distal femur, I've got the pins in place to do that. And now I'm going to advance to the tibial screen. And the, with the machine in the, in the field with me, I was able to advance that just by touching the screen. So Roy, maybe pan out and see the whole EM guide here. So just again, sort of the normal extra measure guide I would use if I was not navigating, but the block's a little bit different. It's got the same adjustments, flexion, extension, varus valgus, and depth. And then you've got the T-Tracker here uh, that's going to be, become the tracker for the navigation. And so I still set it up pretty close to where I want it to be, like I normally would. And we're going to make our, check our slope here. So I put a flat edge on the patient and kind of look from the side. And if we looked at that preoperative lateral, she's probably got about oh, five to seven degrees of posterior slope. And I'm aiming for three. So a little bit less than our native slope. So that's pretty good right there. We're in the ballpark. So we'll put a couple of smooth pins in. So just kind of ballpark here and then you're gonna do your fine tune adjustment. Correct. Yeah, it's one thing with, you know, since we've got the ability to check it on the on the tibial side, you know, with the EM guide, you take a little bit more time, you stress a little bit more about the alignment because, you know, especially gap balancing, you got to get that right. But with this, you're like, well, if we get in the ballpark, at least we have the adjustability. All right, you can come out with that. So, let's see the pointer. So now we're going to register. We've got this rigidly fixed, so this becomes our, our uh, tracker. So now we're going to register the medial malleolus. Just like you did yesterday, going to register the lateral malleolus. Let's pick that up just a little bit, Matt. And then we get the ACL point. So again, one point where we would, if you were doing an IM tibia, that's where your entry point would be. We want to tell the computer what the tibial rotation is because that's going to affect the slope and the varus valgus. Oh. And then we're going to do one point on the, on the tibia medially and laterally. So basically where you would think you would put your stylus. Low point. And then on the lateral side. There was a question, Craig. Um, you know, the, the advantage of avoiding intramedullary canal on the femur. Why, why instrument to canal and navigate? Uh, because this is baby steps, right? So if you're not a navigator and you want to be a little bit better than how you normally are, I think initially you want to use instruments that you're very familiar with because if you bail out, it's already there for you like you normally do it. Um, you know, they're, they're coming up with some applications with this specifically, some guides that may put the, uh, the femoral cutting guide on without having to instrument the canal. But right now it's just sort of one step towards full on navigation. Sure, optimization of standard instrumentation. Correct. Can we say that? Can we agree? Oh, we can, yeah. Ooh, that was good. All right, so we put our PCL retractor in and we've got our tibia exposed and now we want to see what our plan cut was. So we put the cut checker in the slot, go to that next screen. So I take, uh, I cut off the top. So from the cut height part here, I've got the cut checker in the slot. So I'm gonna basically have to do some math and subtract four millimeters from that for my cut height. So I'm in one degree of posterior slope I mentioned yesterday that slope is usually where we make the, the biggest mistakes. 
So I want to go up to three degrees of slope with my adjustment. I want to get out of valgus and go one degree closer so that I'm zero degrees mechanical. And so now, now what we're seeing here is I'm going to cut 14 off the lateral side and eight off the medial side because I'm cutting off the top and that's too much. So I'm going to adjust this up. And so now I'm closer to that, you know, 10, 11 on the lateral side. And the, uh, the thinnest uh, poly with the base plate is nine. So I'm usually shooting for about nine or 10 on that side. So again, I'm a little bit better than I was. And that's what we're gonna take. Yeah, you're popping in out of valgus there. Did, uh, oh, you I wanna was, zero out that bear, bear's valgus? When I, what, I was taking off the cut checker and so the uh, block was wobbling a little bit. So Good now, job on the public math. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So now we're bringing in the robot. That's me. Absolutely no regard for the PCL, obviously. You, you, no, are, you no take that thing every PCL. single time. That's right. Oh, ow, I'm sorry oh. to say. Oh. Yeah, question from the audience. Why why slope in this PS knee? Why uh, three degrees? Well, you know, zero, I think zero, two, three degrees is okay, but uh, even with this, if I aim for zero and the blade skies a little bit as I'm cutting, I might end up with reverse slope and I don't want that. So I, I'm okay with three degrees, but, but typically what I found, just like we saw with that flexion extension, is that it's more likely to sky the other way. And so I might end up with one or two degrees of posterior slope, which I'm okay with. Yeah, and so you know, one again, one nice thing about this is that we're not um, we're not putting any pins in the diaphysis. Not that what you did yesterday is you know a tragedy, uh, but we are getting the navigation within the wound without extra pins. All right, so this is our um, our verification, and again, we got three degrees of slope, three to four, so maybe three and a half. We're zero on the mechanical. And again, if we do that higher level math, we've cut nine off the medial side and uh, about two off the medial, or nine off the lateral side and about two off the medial side. So we'll take the guide off. Have so, you found uh, navigation to be instructive uh, for you when you use standard instruments, just to try to understand, you know, cut, slope, barris, valgus? I you think you're better? I do, yeah. Because so, of your use? You know, what you, f what you find is that a little bit of a uh, scythe with your saw can be two or three degrees. And uh, there's some good studies out there that show that surgeons that use navigation, they'll look at how they did before navigation, they'll look at how they did with navigation, and then when the hospital loses the navigation, they looked at how they did afterwards, and they were much better surgeons without navigation after they had done a series of cases with it because it gives you that, uh, that feedback and so you can be more accurate. So you notice I haven't taken any osteophytes out. She's got pretty large medial osteophytes here. Uh, that's gonna affect not only our balance, but our sizing. So while we've got it kind of exposed here, I'll take some of those osteophytes off. And- Do you ever do a reduction, a reduction, Craig? Yeah, and, and, a, and a really severe one, it's not, unusual that after you've done all your basic releases that you got to downsize and lateralize. So we're also going to size the tibia while we're here. So that's a two and a half. So I think we'll probably be a two or a two and a half depending on the femur size. We'll see a rangeur. So the 
the Xactec system, like a lot of systems, allows for kind of one up, one down. So I, I get a ballpark with the tibia, and then I figure out what my femur size is later, and I can adjust it if I need to from there. Is that uh, a, symmet a symmetric tibial base plate? A symmetric tibial base plate, yes. So come out with the retractors. See the 13, 15. So we trust the navigation that we have a, a straight leg if the distal cut and the proximal tibia cut are parallel. So now we just need to balance. All right, so got the spacer block in. That was a little tight going in. Um, and that's, this, is in the, this is in the mid range. I usually shoot for about an, a 10 or 11 because if I shoot for a nine and they're tight, I don't have anywhere to go down. Yeah. So that's a 13, I see the 11. Are you getting information there on the flexion on the screen? Sorry, we don't see the split screen. No, so now we're not getting, for the, for the, for the plus application, again, sort of the introductory version, there is no uh, information at this point about the tension of the ligaments, the size of the gap. That's kind of the next level um, on the navigation. So with this system, basically what we're confirming, and we know for sure, is that we have the distal femur and the proximal tibia cut the way that we want to in the coronal and the sagittal plane. And so if we have our extension space balanced, we will have a straight knee. So if we look here, I've got the spacer block in. I'm giving a little bit of a varus stress and it opens up, you know, one millimeter maybe. I like it to be very tight and, ex and full extension. And on the lateral side, we're opening up a little bit more. So this is with an 11 spacer block. So we're still tight a little bit medially. And so I'm gonna do all my releases in, in extension. So at this point, we're not moving on to our flexion gap until we like the balance in extension. So as I, we talked about, I took the medial osteophytes off. My next move is to release the posterior capsule around off of the posterior medial tibia. So Matt kind of exposes that for me. Bring that this way. Yeah, that's a good look. And I'm gonna go around the edge here. So posterior medial structures because of tight extension. Exactly, and uh, one of the speakers mentioned that yesterday that if, if, if you're aiming for making extension changes, you wanna go posterior. And right here, it's kinda hard to appreciate, but there's, this is an osteophyte that overhangs. And so you can imagine in full extension, this is tenting the posterior capsule and that's making it tighter on the medial side. So not only do we wanna release the capsule here, but then we wanna take a, a ranger and get, get around this back side. So in a way, this is a reduction osteotomy, but I think what we're really removing is it's not her native tibia, it's what's built up over time from the arthritis. So now we've reduced the backside here, come off with that, and we usually have one more osteophyte that we need to get, and that's on the femoral side. So again, he's got the MCL protected, and we take an osteotome, and this is an osteophyte right here. So if we take that out, that's also gonna take some tension off the MCL. So we'll come back into extension. We had an 11 spacer block in, so let's see the 13. But we were loose laterally, so we're releasing the medial side, so we should open up the space more. And now that 13 that was tight before goes in easier. So now we're one or two millimeters medially here, and we're one to two millimeters laterally. So that's what I would call a balanced extension gap with the 13 spacer block. I also know that we'll get the smallest insert in. So we know we're not gonna be recutting our tibia at all. So we'll pull the tibial pins out, mm -hmm. but still leave the femoral pins because I'm not sure yet the size of my flexion gap relative to my extension gap. 
<clears throat> so now we're gonna size the femur. Uh, my default is three degrees from the posterior condylar axis, but I'm, I'm really not referencing any of those anatomic landmarks when I do my rotation. So we'll see about what our size is. more like a four right now. So we're right on a four, which means we had a two and a half tibia, but we'll probably go up to a three. So I'm now, gonna, are you referencing anterior uh, central or that along that lateral lateral ridge? I go, right? la I go to the lateral ridge, because if, uh, if you're gonna notch, that's usually where you notch. So I'm referencing that highest point on the lateral side. So now we're gonna put a pin in on the medial side so rotationally, I'm kind of rotating around the medial side because I want to keep the, you know, I'm posterior referencing. So I want to keep the posterior medial thickness uh, pretty much the same as the implant thickness. And I think that's a similar philosophy of what you were doing yesterday where you're trying to, mm -hmm. you're trying to maintain the posterior medial side. So when we change our rotation here, I'm going to be rotating off the medial side and, and making sure I control that posterior medial resection. So here, you know, with laminar spreaders, I have no idea how many newtons or pounds I'm putting on it. I just tension it until it's fully tensioned. So I'm not really I going... I should tell the audience you're really strong. Be careful. I don't know if that's true. So now I'm, I'm eyeballing 90 degrees with the sort of the full-on navigation capability when I when I do that what I would do at this point I'd have trackers on I would tension it and I would take a, a snapshot at 90 degrees and then with navigation I would move the femoral component around until I like the size of the gap so that's sort of the next evolution if you go from the plus to the pro alright so I like that it's parallel to my tibia so I'll pin the lateral side. Just kind of confirm that. All right, we'll take the laminar spreaders out. And so I had a 13 in extension. This is uncaptured posteriorly. So I can check my gap before I make the cut. All right, I, it should be good this way because I already saw that it was parallel. And my eye can see to half a degree that's been confirmed by science. So I know that that's parallel. And then this is just a feel for me. So with that 13, it's pretty solid inflection. And so I know that that matches my extension gap. If at this point, I was worried about my extension or flexion gap being, my flexion gap being off from my extension gap, I can translate this block up or down one or two millimeters. So that's what those holes are for. So if I had a, an 11 block in extension, for instance, and a 13 in flexion, I would translate this block down two millimeters to close the flexion gap. But in this case, um, we got it just like we like. So now I'm just gonna cut the posterior. And you talked about really good assistance. Matt put the medial retractor in to protect the MCL, and I didn't even tell him. So we're lucky. Matt was telling me a story about one of our fellows from a couple of years ago. The last two months of his fellowship, apparently he told the assistants not to help. Because he was worried where he was going, they wouldn't help. And so he needed to know to remember to ask for help. So I don't know if you noticed the, uh, the resection on the lateral side was just a few millimeters. It's kind of a skim cut. So if, if, if I was purely measured resection, you know, that distal femoral cut came out to, I took 10 off the medial side and nine off the lateral side. So if I was purely measured resection, I would want that same ratio here, but I think that I would not be balanced. So here, this is just a skim cut on the lateral side. And now I'm going to just confirm now that I can get really under the femur that that 13 is what I want. 
and that were matched. So at this point, I can pull out the femoral pins because I know I'm not going to be retaking uh, anything off the top there. Uh, and pin, threaded pins. Question from the audience, Craig, about the, the rotation again. So um, you're obviously choosing not to. Have you used this system for the rotational information? Uh, I ha I ha when I do the, the pro application, which is, you know, full on uh, extra pins and navigating the size and everything, doing all the anatomic landmarks, I do use the system for rotation, but my reference point is still my tibia cut to be parallel to my tibia. I have the secondary check of transepicolar axis and posterior axis, but those are my, that's my secondary check, not my primary check. Yeah. So I sized it. Registration's a little bit more extensive. Uh, just a little bit. You, like I said, you gotta paint the posterior condyles, uh, but outside of that, it's, it's not any, any more. How about so, the epicondylar information? You find that reliable? Uh, actually, I don't. I, I, I don't really pay attention to the epicondylar stuff. I, I use the posterior condylar axis as my secondary check. So this is uh, kind of my angel wing. Um, I want to make sure I'm not notching. So I take the stibul tibial stylus down to the zero mark. Um, and so right here we're at one millimeter. I don't know if you can see that and I'm touching. Yeah, so well. I'm you know, I think because I rotated off the medial side and we really had a skim cut on the lateral side, as I brought this block down, I'm, I'm pretty close to where I'm probably going to notch in this position with one millimeter. So again, not to go zero-itis, let's take the threaded headed pins out. I'm 13 millimeters in flexion. I'm 13 millimeters in extension but I don't want to notch. So I'm actually going to translate this block up one millimeter and I'm okay with a one millimeter flexion extension gap mismatch. If I had to go to two millimeters, I would, I would do something different like increase the size of my femoral component. So I've just translated that up one millimeter. That'll make me feel better about not notching. That's bad form. And that does mean I need to recut posteriorly, and it's going to be one millimeter. Just like the, well, not quite like the robot. The robot's half a millimeter, right? <laughs> All right, so posterior done. Now we'll move on to the anterior cut. Through the slot. Makes me feel good. We did a notch. I switched to a, yeah, thin, looks great. a thinner saw blade for the chamfer cuts. I do the anterior chamfer first. And you didn't have to put a bone plug in because you didn't instrument the canal, but we saved this bone for the bone cut. And the assistants tell me that's the favorite part of the case, so I'm actually providing job satisfaction by instrumenting the canal. We pull these there should two. be competitions for bone plug preparation. Oh, for sure. Um, that could be a, an ICJR symposium for Nashville. <laughs> it, may be an, it may be an idea. All right, we'll pull this off now. And so now before we cut the, the notch, I go ahead and clean up kind of behind and any osteophytes. So Carlos is really strong, but I feel there bad if I make him lift on the leg. So we have this suitcase that we, again, are able to use the, instrument, the uh, canal for. Watch your head there, Matt. Matt, pull your head back. There you go. So this is when I get the medial meniscus because I can really see the 
how intimate it is with the medial collateral ligament and make sure that now that I love my balance, I'm not going to do anything to the deep MCL that would jeopardize that. Uh, fat emboli, fact or fiction? Oh, fat, fat emboli is real. I think the question is how factual is the clinical relevance? The uh, TEA data says for dang sure fat is going across their heart and it happens not only when we instrument the canal but when we saw the end of the bone so it, it may be related to volume um, I do know the the UC Davis stuff that they were talking about yesterday when you really get into checking like uh, many mental status exams etc uh, people have some changes in their mental status for up to six months after knee replacement mm -hmm. and the question is is that anesthesia? Is it instrumenting the canal? Is it fat emboli? And I don't think the studies have yet kind of uh, figured all that out. So if we looked again at her lateral, she had a little bit of posterior osteophyte. Um, so we'll get that out. It's not going to be, in my experience, in, in a patient like this, it's not going to be enough that it's really going to affect my extension gap. If I have a lot of osteophytes, um, and I'm expecting the extension gap to open up, uh, then I would have left those femoral pins in until I knew exactly what my extension gap was removing those osteophytes. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's so Keep it scored home. So right now you're 13 millimeters extension, 14 in flexion, is that right? And your, your polyethylene is 13? Uh, correct. All right. So now we're putting our trial femoral component on. And this is a, the trial is a, um, it's not an asymmetric trial, so it's left or right. And there are little windows in the trial component that we can see where the real one's gonna sit. So I just give it a little bit of a look and make sure we're not gonna overhang one way or the other. And now we'll prepare the box. This part of the instrumentation is pretty slick uh, because it's a quick way to prepare the box off of the trial. Put that reamer through and then we just make sure we get the bone off the side. So, you know, in theory, at this point of the case, the only point of trialing is to make sure that the parts fit. But we shouldn't be surprised about the size of the polyethylene or whether we have a flexion extension gap mismatch or whether we need to do any more soft tissue work outside the patellofemoral joint uh, because we've already checked it and double checked it with our spacer blocks. So that's the 13 with a uh, three tibia. And maybe we can pan out and see, like you were looking at yesterday, you know, she did not have a flexion contracture preoperatively. So I think we've got her, we've got her straight in the coronal. I don't know uh, if we can see anything from the side. So, you know, she's straight, coronal and sagittal. And then we're going to go up in our in a flexion, and that's you know just against gravity. And then Roy, if we can get a shot um, from the boom going straight in. So that's at about 90 degrees of flexion, and essentially, again, we shouldn't be surprised, but we don't want to see lift off medially or laterally when we go into deep flexion, which we don't. So we're about 110 right now. So. With that 13, I kind of had to snap it in or push it in when I trialed, so it's to me that's not too loose, even with the millimeter mismatch. And she does come out into full extension, you know, and quote, no thumbs technique, she tracks fine, so I don't have to do any lateral release. So at this point, we can open parts and start prepping for cement. So I, um, I, I do my tibial rotation and extension because that's where they're bearing the weight most of the time. So I want the polyethylene to be symmetric medially and laterally in full extension. 
I know there's rotation and some people float the tibial base plate, but I don't think they're loading their knee as much in flexion as extension, so that's where I mark my rotation. Hey, hey Greg, the audience is asking if you could do a little varus valgus stress and extension before uh, you take... Uh, oh yeah, we can do that. Off. I don't, I don't because I did with the uh, spacer block, so I don't want to be surprised at this point. So that's varus stress right there. I don't know how, yeah, we're close in there. So that's full extension, right? I don't want an opening because as we talked about yesterday, when you flex a little bit and you loosen the poster capsule, you are gonna open up some. So that's about a millimeter. And then maybe we can see laterally. I didn't keep the, see if I wasn't a fat pad friend, we could see that. So that's stressing the other way, and that's about a millimeter, and I'm breathing hard, so that's proof that I'm pushing hard. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we'll get it in flexion. And then going up. near in, a grunt. Yeah. Going up into 90 degrees, trying not to, seeing that we're not lifting off at all. Yeah, it looks good, man. Looks really good. All right, now we're going to whack off the parts. And we can open up parts. All right, so we're going to put our three base plate on. And I think we can see that we're not um, flush up against that medial side. So I've, I've got it where my rotation is, where I marked it, and then I'm just translating it. And then I'll check on the lateral side, and I'm well covered and not overhanging. So we'll pin this. Matt just used his bare hands. He didn't even use a mallet right there. I don't know if you saw that. Mm, impressive. I, I'm telling you, I mean, we've worked with these guys for years, but every day I'm a little more astounded at their skill level. Yes. You, you did mix. mention there's half sizes available on that tibia? Yes. Um, one, there's, the sizes are one through six, and there's half sizes up to four and a half. There's not a five and a half. So we punched, and now this is the modular tamp. Uh, we, adjust, we can adjust the depth. So in this window, I see the size, which is size three. So as you go up in size, the depth of your keel increases. Uh, so that kind of decreases on inventory that we just have one tamp to do it all here. And then we'll irrigate. And I also noticed you were using a uh, Palicos yesterday, is that right? Correct. Uh, so we're using a, a medium viscosity cement. Um, it's probably similar in consistency to Palicos. I'm curious from the audience if there's, if there's any, any thoughts about uh, the kind of cement it's used and whether that has any effect on fixation. You know, there's one article out of Wash U I think it was Dr. Nunley, and they were revising some loose tibias and they blamed it on the cement. Got any thoughts around mm -hmm. that? Anybody have any thoughts on cement technique for uh, tibial failure, aseptic loosening? Anybody from the audience? Yeah, there's certainly been a lot more talk in the last year or two about um, cement te technique for sure. All right, I just, look at this. Rotation. See this bone plug? Beth, oh. Beth did that. Custom. I mean, you didn't even, we didn't even know she was making it. And it's, there it is, it's ready to go. It's amazing. It's almost like it was navigated. I forgot, that's exactly where the navigation went when I was done with it. You just All don't right. see robotic bone plugs. <laughs> All right, let's see the PCL. So for me, you know, cementing, it is really important to uh, pulse lavage. That's been shown. Uh, it's important to get it as dry as you can. And 
I think it's important to have a fresh set of gloves. So I did change gloves. You know, at this point we're gonna be touching things that are permanent in the body and I think it's good to start mm -hmm. with uh, something that's clean. And we wanna decrease as much as we can the amount of lipid that might get in between the cement and the bone and also the component. So you can see in that split screen, Beth doesn't know that she's on camera. She's gonna put cement on the component. And I want you to do that. That's also been shown uh, that if you actually press cement onto the component, it improves the bond. So I'm definitely pressurizing down into the keel and stem. And where we lose pressurization or where we, we don't get as much when we insert the component is around the periphery because the cement just kind of spits out. It doesn't compress like it does centrally. So I do think trying to get interdigitation around the periphery as much as you can is important. You could use a gun. I know some people use a cement gun to do that. Mm -hmm. And then again, we just want to make sure that surface is as dry as it can be. And you can see cement all over the component. And this is definitely the part of the case that when you hear Art talking about cementless knees, you say to yourself, that sounds really attractive because this is probably the, the most tedious part of the case, but also the one that gets everybody the most nervous. So it's cement frenzy. Yeah, I definitely have some cement anxiety. I'm, I'm guilty of that for sure. Come out with that. Yeah, you have you have like a timer going or something, right? You gotta yeah. Hit, you gotta hit. You gotta obsessive hit, about it, man. You gotta hit it's your an issue. hit your marks. All right, so femoral side, same kind of thing. I want to get as much pressurization as I can along the surfaces. And so I put cement on the whole femur up to the posterior chamfer. Um, I don't put it posteriorly because I don't want it to get pushed to the back and me not be able to get it. Mm -hmm. so we're just pressurizing there. But on the component itself, as we see, Beth has put it on the posterior part of the component and the posterior chamfers as well as anterior to get a little more compression. So I kind of put it on inflection first and then lift up to try to compress that cement posteriorly before I impact it. So you got your little tibial protector there. Is that to keep the cement out of the uh locking mechanism or is just it's uh, actually you're going to see it's 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 for the trialing um, so the modular trials that we use for the polyethylenes have metal and we don't want the metal to contact the base plate so this protects it so we got a little i'm just going to go ahead and trial it so you know this is the trialing system here so you can see this is a 13 go that way a 13 millimeter shim it's metal for a size four uh, and then we have a topper. So this is, there's two toppers in each set that are universal for each size femur. And then these are the shims that go up in the one millimeter increment. So if you wanna, at this point, trial up and see what you like. So we're yeah. starting with the 13. And again, we kinda gotta, you know, push it hard in flexion. So I know that that flexion space is pretty good. Then we'll bring it out into full extension and lock it back into place. So that the trial is in place there. And we give it a little axial load. I'm not 
not not hyper extending or trying to you know really press this thing into extension I'm just giving a little bit of an axial load and you can see that compresses it down on the medial side where we were still up a little bit we'll do one more clean cement still pretty good and then at this point I'm gonna leave it in full extension until the cement is hardened I think that's pretty important because if you're you're messing around a lot with moving the leg while the cement is curing. Um, we know there's going to be voids, and I think you know you may uh, you may have a really happy patient. They're the one of the lucky 80%, but they may not be happy in 10 years when you're having to revise them for loosening. So it does take a little extra time to wait until the cement hardens, but I think it's worth it. Press that patella. Alright, so at this point, got all the parts cemented and in. This is when I let the tourniquet down. I know we're getting close on time, but basically from this point, I leave it in extension. I'll clean up any bleeding. And then I do a three minute um, diluted betadine soak mm -hmm. before irrigating and putting in the real poly and closing. And go ahead and take the tourniquet off. All right.